what Justin Trudeau asked you. <laughs> so let's give Dr. Leonard a very warm ILA welcome. And uh, Dr. Leonard, uh, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much. Yeah, by the way, that rather cryptic rock star thing that time did is because the way I worked my way through college was with other Columbia students. We had a rock band and we opened for Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock. Um, we were in the uh, Grease movie, et cetera. I was not, by then I was on my Fulbright to Kenya studying the Northeast dialects of uh, coastal Swahili. Um, and I think I had more fun actually. So uh, back to the nitty gritty here, uh, warning, a lot of these case studies are very, very unsettling, and it's very easy to be a linguist and not come across this kind of unsettling uh, detail. So just so you are prepared. So um, as Professor Bandi Rao said, um, we have a variety of um, forensic linguistics, um, affiliations, and I'll talk about that in a bit at Hofstra. So forensic linguistics analyzes language as evidence. Everything almost in the law either is language or it happens through language. We have subpoenas, warrants, interrogations, death threats, contracts, testimony, it's all language. And medical or ballistic testimony is not about language, but it's through language. And we as linguists know things are never as simple as they seem in language. <clears throat> so people in the legal system are very adept at using language, but they are not very adept at analyzing it scientifically. You really need to be trained, as we linguists know, because we know how in our journey of understanding how language works, we have proceeded to analyze language scientifically and not only intuitively by the seat of your pants. And the analogy I often use is that judges and lawyers are really adept at using language, but they don't know a lot about what happens under the hood in the internal combustion engine. And that's something that we can help with. And we know that the legal system often gets things wrong. A uh, terrible statistic is since Florida reinstated the death penalty in 1972, 30 people have been exonerated from death row, mostly from DNA. And those 30 people would have eventually been put to death. And many of them had confessed because of the way the legal system works. All of the cases I'm going to discuss started with one case of mine in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania State Police came to me and said, you're a linguist. Can you look at these two letters? Can you tell us what you can see about whoever wrote these letters? And that turned into uh, a murder case. A woman had been threatened in letters. She had been killed. And then someone had said, you're looking in the wrong place. I'm a serial killer. Um, she's the fifth woman I've killed. And it all turned out to have been written and orchestrated by her husband who had murdered her. So once that happened, um, I came to the attention of the FBI, who at exactly that moment in time, had been very happy with the success of forensic linguistics in the Unabomber case. The Unabomber case was, I think, 17 years uh, looking for uh, Ted Kaczynski. They didn't know it was him, of course. And the utility of forensic linguistics was not actually in catching him because it was the brother of Kaczynski who, when they made public uh, his uh, manifesto, he said, Gee, that sounds like Ted. But they surrounded his shack in Montana, and they were about to go in, 
and they were waiting for whatever the paperwork they needed. And they were told that the news people had discovered what was about to happen and they were going to go live with it. And if that had happened, Ted would have found out and Ted would have disappeared like a wisp of smoke. He was living in an unheated cabin in the high woods of Montana. And he had hidey holes in various places stacked with food and he could have just disappeared. So they had to go in and they went in and they found the manifesto versions. They found bomb making equipment, but none of that would have been allowed to been used in his trial if they could not have shown that they had valid reason to go in. And the valid reason was the similarity of his writings to known specimens of his writing. And that was uh, spearheaded by Jim Fitzgerald, who, who was the guy from the FBI who called me up and said, look, we're training our agents these days in forensic linguistics. Would you come down to Quantico and help us train them? So I said, OK. Uh, and that was quite an experience. And it just went on from there. So one case that we've had relatively recently for our Innocence Project, which is now being called the Justice Project, because we're doing a lot more than uh, only Innocence, um, was Melissa Lucio. Melissa Lucio was scheduled to be put to death on April 27th, 2022 for the death of her two-year-old in 2007. And she'd been on death row for a very long time. At that time when her two-year-old died, Melissa Lucio was pregnant with twins and had just lost her two-year-old. And they brought her in for questioning and her husband, Robert Alvarez. And the report, officers reported after five hours of questioning till three in the morning that Melissa had confessed to the murder of Mariah, the little girl. So imagine that her state, pregnant with twins, and she just lost her little girl. There was evidence that was suppressed that she had actually tripped down a flight of stairs the day before. Um, the district attorney, who I think is uh, serving a jail sentence for something, now wanted a big case of a baby killer because he was running for re-election. And at the time I got involved in the case, uh, half of the legislature in Texas, even the people who really, really believe in the death penalty, did not want Lucio to be executed. Uh, public opinion had turned and a lot of people wanted um, her to have a new trial, but a lot of people didn't want that. They wanted her to be executed. So I was approached by the Innocence Project, the people who started the uh, DNA-based Innocence Project, and the uh, Cornell Center for the Study of Death Penalty and Women Worldwide, who study how women are, well, as you'll see, uh, this was a good case in point. So data was provided to us, five hours of questioning of Lucio and three hours of questioning her husband. Her husband during his interrogation, well, it isn't an interrogation, it was just a fact-finding interview, he was told, gee, you know, really sorry for your loss. Wow, I don't know how you deal with all those kids. I only have two, and uh, it's very frustrating. And he said to them, gee, I thought you were going to look at me for this crime, I mean, for the death, because I had been known to be physical with the kids. He even said that in his interview. But they didn't care about that. They wanted Melissa. And what they did was weaponize her gender, the fact that she was a mother the fact that the person she respected the most was a mother. And they used a technique that at its inception in, I don't know, many decades ago, was an improvement over physical interrogation, 
the third degree or beating people. And it's called the Reed technique. And the Reed technique is so firm in American mindsets that I don't think I've ever seen a television show that did not use the Reed technique. And it is guilt presumptive. You presume guilt. Supposedly, you do fact finding first, but eh, and then you go for the jugular. And one of the things you do is you have these closed uh, choice sets. So did you kill her because you are a monster or was it an accident? I didn't kill her. Melissa says like about 100 times in her many hour interrogation. And they, you just ignore it. They ignore it. And they loom over her. There's this uh, very uh, amazing picture of this enormous Texas Ranger with a big gun on his hip leaning over Melissa. And imagine her state of mind. So you just go on and on. Look, if it was an accident, then you'd be okay. It, it won't be as bad. Uh, but if you're a monster, then you'll be put to death and things like that. And many times, unfortunately, people given that closed choice just to stop it. I've, I've done a lot of false confessions. Um, we'll say, oh, okay, it was an accident. But now you've just admitted to killing the person. So our research question was, what are the differences, if any, between the questioning of Alvarez and the questioning of Lucio? And we compared competing hypotheses, information gathering interview or an accusatory interrogation. And part of our theoretical apparatus was speech events and institutional talk. Speech events, of course, are identifiable human activities in which language plays the central role in defining it. So if you go in to buy a car, you don't expect to get a sermon. You go into church, you don't expect the uh, minister or priest to get up there and start selling you a car. This is very useful, by the way, uh, when we think about it, that it, it helps processing because there's always a possibility that you're going to misapprehend something that somebody is saying. But once you know you're in a specific speech event, that narrows the possibilities of what that person is saying to you. And it simplifies what you're allowed to say. So institutional talk, and there's a lot of good research on that, is speech event between a lay person and an institutional figure. It could be a doctor and a, um, a patient or the police and uh, someone being interviewed or interrogated. Very simply, the police ask the questions and Lucio and Alvarez give the answers in this case. And as Roger Shai always liked to differentiate, interviews are information gathering, interrogations are accusatory. And Roger Shai, S-H-U-Y, uh, who was my mentor and who established forensic linguistics in the United States and who has written, I don't know, 40 books for on it for Oxford University Press alone, um, always said, it's amazing that the police go in and very often assume the person is guilty when they should be information gathering. Imagine a general with his troops and Tomorrow is the battle. And the general assumes that the opposition is going to come from the east. And someone says, well, shouldn't we consider that they might be coming from the other direction? And he says, no. And they're wrong. But this is what happens very often in police interrogations. There's an assumption of guilt instead of information gathering. And there's a lot of pressure on police to catch criminals, especially in high uh, profile cases. I mean, the system is set up for such things. Uh, before that, back to the read technique. I've been doing research in Europe on non-accusatory methods of interview and interrogation. 
And uh, in England, of course, we have, well, not of course, but we have the peace method. We have <clears throat> creative in Scandinavia where uh, they're information gathering, uh, essentially. And the last time I trained the behavioral analysis unit of the FBI, I said to them, I don't understand why the rank and file are still using read technique because you guys are using a different form of information uh, gathering and interrogation, uh, which is called the high value detainee group. And it's uh, from uh, a variety of federal agencies who said they could not afford to have false confessions because they're interviewing people who may or may not be setting bombs. They want information. The point is not to throw them in jail. The point is information. So it, it's ridiculous to use something like read technique. And they said, well, we don't use it. So uh, this is one of uh, my um, goals to spread the good word that even, or especially the FBI and the CIA and uh, Department of Defense do not use techniques like uh, read technique. I thought that the Canadians had stopped using because there were a lot of court cases throwing out uh, confessions that were gotten with it. But the last time I trained the Mounties, some of the investigators said, no, we still use it all the time. So you linguists and me, we have an educational uh, opportunity here. Okay, so our expert report talked about lexical choice, turn design, sequence organization, overall structural organization, and social epistemology and relation. For example, what does it mean to be a mother? And, and uh, it was a very long report, and I'm not going to give you the whole thing, but just a couple of highlights. <clears throat> we noticed this in a keyword concordance of, uh, uh, you know, a, um, a corpus analysis of the uh, the questions. I would say that this shows that there is a real theme of cold-blooded killer, and you see these closed choices. Right now, it looks like you're a cold-blooded killer. Or are you a cold-blooded killer? Or were you a frustrated mother? After many hours, some people just say, yeah, okay. And we also did analyses of the different kinds of questions. So those little dots are abuse, physical aspects of case, morality, praise and blame, parenthood and family roles, information gathering, case details, evidence procedure, and camaraderie. So notice, just for example, the gray for Alvarez, the husband, 66% were information gathering, but only 24% were information gathering for Lucio. And um, morality and praise and blame, 31% Lucio and only 3%, 4% for him. They really just, we're gonna go after her, we have the technique, we're gonna use her gender. And this was the point of the people from Cornell. So this was a report for clemency and habeas, habeas corpus, perhaps a new trial or freedom. Gender bias tainted Ms. Lucio's capital murder prosecution and contributed to her wrongful conviction. Now, I did not say there were gender stereotypes. I reported the facts and that was the conclusion of, uh, that was what was taken from our report. It's pretty clear. <clears throat> and I did not say that the prosecution repeatedly weaponized. That's a conclusion. And one of the things that we cannot do is make legal conclusions. We report the facts. And my report joined an expert on uh, false confessions and an expert on police procedure. And two days before she was to be executed, she was granted a stay. Something else we do is help people write things that other people can understand. 
And I was recruited onto a group of judges, prosecutors, and defense counsel in Arizona and asked to help them in their task, a monumental task, of rewriting the capital jury instructions, which means the death penalty instructions, of course, for the state of Arizona so that somebody might actually understand it who didn't have a law degree. And as we know, there is what's called a tyranny of knowledge. If you understand something you think, especially if you don't reflect on it, that it's obviously clear to everyone. But again, as we linguists know, <clears throat> language is not so simple. So I worked on this for a while myself, and then I recruited my interns uh, who were working on death penalty in other cases. And um, we set about systematically revising, helping them to revise the language. So there is a movement called the plain language movement. So there's a lot of literature and there's a lot of very good literature from linguists like uh, Peter Tiersma and others. So the way we approach this is we had three teams. One looked only at lexical. In other words, instead of trying to redo everything, let us just look at lexical problems. Let us look at syntactic problems. Let us look at semantic problems, different senses of the same word. We used corpus analysis. Um, uh, corpus analysis can be so useful and it can really be mishandled too, as we see in a lot of court cases lately. But um, for example, I was asked to rewrite the death, not sorry, the uh, definitions of murder one and murder two for the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. And um, what had happened was over the years, because of court cases, additional things got added. So there was really very, very little difference. So obviously in a murder, one of the things is that you did it on purpose or willfully, right? And it turns out if you look up willful in COCA, Corpus of Contemporary American English, the most common use for <clears throat> lay people of willful is the little kid who will not eat their spinach. So you want to avoid that word because it might drag the attention and the understanding away from the idea of doing something on purpose. So we can use corpus and other analyses and just keep paring down. A lot of things like, well, uh, there, there's so much to do and so much to explain, and I'm sure you guys understand a lot of it. But here's just one example, all right? The instruction says, the instruction that I will give you contain the law that applies to this phase of the trial, that is guilt or innocence, and then death or not death. I will give you some of the instructions now and the rest after the evidence is presented. And that's probably fairly clear to us, but it's not clear to a lot of people. And also realize, as I was working in Ohio on uh, another long story, but the average reading level, not that it's a very scientific uh, measurement, of uh, Ohioans, I believe, is fourth grade. That's average or median. So that means that half the people are below fourth grade. So it's quite a task. So... The first sentence presupposes instructions not introduced until the second sentence. This is an illogical sequence. Again, it's probably not a problem for us who are highly educated, but not for everyone. When I was working with <clears throat> in Quantico with the FBI. <clears throat> Jim Fitzgerald and I would go around to various agencies and uh, 
do presentations and explain forensic linguistics. And this was our mantra. Language can solve and prevent crimes. And the unit that Jim was in and that I was working with um, was the FBI Behavioral Analysis Unit 1, which at those, in those days was counterterrorism and threat assessment. Now, there's a TV show, Criminal Minds, which is about the Behavioral Analysis Unit. And some of it is even fairly what they do. I know most of it, you know, as you can imagine, is television. But uh, Jim was the technical advisor for years uh, for them. Um, so the units get reorganized. There's a unit for crimes against children, et cetera, zero crimes against adults. And this is all under the uh, NCAV, the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. And when we would do presentations, almost always somebody would come from the audience and say, you know, I'm an investigator in Milwaukee. We have a case that we've been really puzzling over. We found all these letters at the scene of the crime, but it never occurred to us that this might help us. You guys want to take a look at it. Okay. There's even now a book that has a fictional book that apparently is a bestseller. Somebody brought it to my attention. It's called The Lies You Wrote. Uh, and the protagonist is a FBI forensic linguist, one of the few. And, uh, at the end is an acknowledgement. And uh, to our surprise, it was acknowledging me and my videos and Jim Fitzgerald as a legendary uh, FBI agent. Jim started the CTAD, C-T-A-D, Communicated Threat Assessment Database. He took all of the criminally oriented communications that passed through the hands of the FBI and put them in a computerized database. You would have thought that they had done that a long time ago, but they didn't. And this way we were able to access and for example, in another murder case, I was able to show that to begin a threat with FU, not F, but you know, the word, of course, uh, is actually rare. Only 0.8% of the documents in the CTAD, and most of them being threats, began that way. So that was an idiosyncrasy that linked question documents in another case where somebody killed his wife and unfortunately his children too. So I was trained by William LaBeouf at Columbia before he went to Pennsylvania. He also set me up to do my research in Kenya. Uh, my specialty is uh, various dialects, as I say, of Swahili, East African Bantu language, and um, also William Diver, who's the founder of the Columbia um, Linguistics School. And that's a uh, very functional semantic um, uh, based theory. And it turned out that the two were a very good combination. But in any event, with under Bill Above, I did uh, forensic, uh, sorry, sociolinguistic um, uh, collections all over the world in Swahili, in Thailand, in London, uh, in, uh, in America. And as you know, of course, sociolinguistically, um, dialects vary and uh, uh, language varies all the time according to who you are. And we have these accretions of in our language that show whether we watch cricket or baseball, et cetera, et cetera. So how can this prevent crimes? Well, remember the BAU unit is threat assessment. Threat assessment is even more important these days with all the school shooting. Most school districts have threat assessment teams, okay? So Jim and I would present, now Jim does behavioral analysis. They've studied the patterns of serial killers, of bombers, et cetera. This matches these guys, okay? But what we can do as linguists is narrow the suspect pool. And I'll give you an example in a minute. Because what better way to tell whether a threat may or may not be carried out is if we can tell them who might have written it. And horribly, 
that case I was telling you about just now where the husband killed his wife and children, he was sending death threats to himself and his family and his employer from months before he killed them. I was not called in until after the murders. And the police force was an excellent police force, but it they just obviously didn't know anything about forensic linguistics. And if I had been called in earlier, I would have shown what I had to show, unfortunately, after the murders, that it was the hunt's husband, the father, who was sending these death threats. So obviously, linguistic analysis can often enlighten as to all these features. And here's an example. This was a California case where a woman was receiving, and her, uh, her boyfriend were receiving these very unsettling threats. And one of them said, I challenge that you have the right to save her, to have her, I'm sorry. I challenge that you have the right to have her to yourself. I have known her since a very long time myself, perhaps even longer than you, he said to the boyfriend. So I looked at this and I looked at this and I said, hmm. And then my other mentor from Columbia, Dr. Benji Wald, who was at UCLA, walked by and said, oh, and he said two words. I said, oh, what were those two words? Hint, they were French. Depuis longtemps. Oh. I said, oh, well, I don't expect you guys. I looked at this for half a day and I didn't see anything. Oof. In English, we don't say typically since a very long time. We say since 2013, but not since a very long time. And French and some other languages do say that. So you never go on one feature, but this helped us look very quickly at a guy because there was this was a possibility of violence. And indeed, there was a French speaker and all his other things matched. And we were able to advance the ball that way. So why didn't you come and look over my shoulder an hour ago? So typical investigative assignments when the police or the FBI or somebody comes to me, we have these things. Identifying linguistic features pointing to an author's demographic background. The guy on the left is Ed Kaczynski. That's linguistic demographic profiling that we were just talking about. We also do authorship analysis, compare linguistic patterns in questioned and known writing. And that's from those two murder cases I just talked about. And then analyzing ambiguous phrases, and of course, all phrases are in context, and underlying meaning forensic discourse analysis. This was a case done by my colleague. Tanya Christensen from University of Copenhagen. Here are some recent criminal and domestic and foreign counterterrorism and intel cases that I worked on the past several years. What connects all these? Language. And language is applicable to civil cases too, of course. Um, I was Apple's linguist against Microsoft and Amazon in their uh, defense of the um, trademark App Store. 
and Golo versus Goalie recently, contract disputes in front of uh, uh, international tribunals, Turkey and Turkmenistan, patent infringements, plagiarism, etc. So in the United States, this let's go back to this for a sec. There's two kinds of witness. There's a fact witness. I saw the defendant on April 23rd at 2 p.m. And then there's expert witness. Expert witness explains facts to the trier of fact, whether the jury or a judge, depending on the type of case, that they would not otherwise be able to understand. Okay, And to do that, you have to pass Daubert or Fry standards. So you have to have the qualifications. You have to have sufficient data and you have to have done the methodology correctly. So this is the way I have been able to get into uh, a lot of cases. And of course, nothing succeeds like success. So that third bullet point, once you're accepted by judges in various places, uh, it's easier for them to see their way to letting you testify. But again, everything below uh, the third, fourth, and fifth bullet points all come from that one case that I was talking about. And it can happen with you folks, and we need that. Roger Shai did a demonstration once at Hunter and to for linguists, and he, he had a case, and he said, we need more linguists working as forensic linguists. Please, please join me, he said. And I eventually became his partner years later. So at Hofstra, I've been working overtime, getting a lot of forensic linguistics. We're the only forensic linguistics face-to-face -face program in the Western Hemisphere, for gosh sakes. And it was hard to get the school to approve it. But students are very interested once they find out about it. And we've been very successful in recruiting students. So people also say, well, what am I going to do with forensic linguistics? And we've been going at Hofstra for around 10 years, and plenty of other people have been training forensic linguists. And these are some of the places that our students and others have gotten jobs. Or, you know, FBI and CIA, since everybody wants to be in the FBI and NCIS. Uh, I always tell the students what some folks from the Department of Commerce who were special agents told me, don't go for a, it, it'll be easier if you go for, an, in, uh, for a, an agency that doesn't have its own television show. So here's a, uh, that's from John Benet Ramsey case. Good God, that was another case I got dragged into a horrible case. But um, this is a classic from Roger Shai. He wrote about it years ago. A little girl was kidnapped and on a crumpled up piece of brown paper, this was written and I've transcribed it. So the authority said, what can you tell us about whoever wrote this? Well, it's the spelling, cops. Yes. And then doubter. Yes, exactly. So we propose hypotheses that attempt to explain the non randomness in the data. Daughter is misspelled, cops is misspelled. What theory would account for that? Someone being uneducated. But let's look at all the data. Precious is spelled correctly. It sounds more like someone pretending to yes. be of a certain yeah. type, you know. Exactly. Yeah. So trash can 
you can't spell trash can, how come you can spell corner? The, another, another hypothesis that people uh, often very intelligently proposes, perhaps the person has native language, there's no C for the K sound, uh, that's, it's only a K. But then there's corner, there's come, there's cash. See? Now, Carlson, maybe the person sees the sign and writes down Carlson, but not uh, corner, cash, and come. So Roger almost instantly, much to the amazement of the cops, said, do you have on your um, suspect list a well-educated man from Akron, Ohio? <laughs> and I like to think that the cops said, come on, Roger, it normally takes you a week to do this. Who are you, Sherlock Holmes, all of a sudden? Are you going to say that he walks with a limp and he has a frayed left sleeve, you know, the way Sherlock Holmes always uh, says? I said, just look. And they did. So how did he know that? Well, when you try to dumb down, unless you're a linguist, this is a pretty clumsy version, but I've seen plenty of very, very clumsy dumbing down. It's harder to dumb up, right? Um, unless you're going to dumb down, you don't do all levels at the same time. So spell precious correctly. Um, and what else about this shows that the person is actually well-educated? And it's something that's almost invisible to us well-educated people. Is it the location? The devil's trip at... Yeah, that's how he knew it was <clears throat> accurate. I would argue that also the syntax, the syntactic structure, which is quite complex in some places. That's right, and excellent. And there's something else too, very good though. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we don't see typically unless we really go through things systematically and think of all the systems that we had to learn becoming very literate. Is it punctuation? Yes. The punctuation is perfect. Somebody who can't spell cops should not be able to punctuate that well. <clears throat> so when I teach police and agents and like that, I say, look, here are some of the investigative features that we use. But the most important one is at the bottom. Beware of disinformation. Unless somebody's going to sign his name and address, you have to expect they're going to try to hide who they are. And this is a non-exhaustive list. This just happens to be from the first two murder cases I did that this was very, these were important. It turned out interesting. One of these bullet points is management of narrative time structures and departures from the narrative sequence. That first murder case, those two letters look very, very different that the cops gave me. But I cannot but see narrative structure. For example, LeBov was always teaching us about narrative structure. And also Swahili is a very interesting in many, many ways as 18 uh, genders, uh, grammatical genders, three of which have to do with different aspects of space <laughs> and time. Fabulous, <laughs> complicated and wonderful language, but also the narrative structure is, is a created through a different tense structure. You don't simply use the past tense. I walked in the door, I sat down. You wouldn't use that. You would use a special tense for I sat down. Uh, ka, and uh, I analyzed that for my master's uh, essay. So I always see narrative structure. And one of these uh, letters was like almost pencil scrolled and the other one was very wordy and uh typed up but in both of them there were very complex narrative structures of fast for uh forward looking forward looking back stepping outside to uh um from the narrative sequence and adding information and it was done so well in both of those that even i didn't see it at first so here is a devil struck but only in Akron, Ohio. Now, why isn't this dis disinformation? Because if you happen to have a word for that strip of grass, you don't think, I've never met anybody who, I mean, 
you think that that's the word and must be that everybody uses it. How often do we talk about that? In Nassau County on Long Island, it's called a county strip. And it's called a couple of other things. Most people don't even have a word for it. So this guy didn't think he was giving away any information any more than when he said trash can. But he did. And then the punctuation. So that's a famous case of uh, Rogers, and uh, it's a great one to demonstrate to people how we do what we do. So our Innocence Project, now our Justice Project, the last bullet point there, began analyzing confessions written by investigators, but falsely said to have been written by the accused. Now, it's common for somebody like who's going to take a plea to have the cops help them confess. So they might say, uh, all right, so what did you do after that? Well, I drove and I turned left on Smith Street. No, you can't turn left on Smith. Oh, you're right. I turned right on Smith Street, then left on Jones Street. And what time was that? Um, I don't know. Uh, five, six, can we put down at an unknown time? Yeah, okay. So that clearly is a different situation than when the police say, I wrote down every word and only the words of the suspect verbatim. And we'll see the first case that made me start our Innocence Project, Justice Project. So what we do is we have teams of graduate and even undergraduate who are qualified work with faculty and sometimes uh, law interns. And we also work for investigators. There was a impoverished uh, um, investigative bunch who came to me and they said, can you help us? Um, we spent our budget on experts and can you do this pro bono? And I said, sure. So for eight months, my students and I analyze the language of this woman who was working her way through the Carolinas, marrying and killing, staging the suicide of veterans, getting money from the Veterans Bureau and money for children she didn't have, et cetera. And we were able to demonstrate that the first man that we knew about anyway, his um, suicide note had not been written by him, but it was absolutely written by her. So, yeah, so QB was also tortured uh, in Chicago back in the bad old days. And um, how can it be demonstrated that a confession did or did not originate with the suspect? And we turn to authorship analysis, which is something we do all the time. And as I say, we have uh, Daubert and Fry as the two standards. I said to the torture commission who uh, was looking at his case, I've been successful in doing authorship in first degree murder cases. And I also demonstrated a guy on death row in California for the past 35 years, death row in solitary for 35 years. And he's there because they said he wrote two documents. I showed that he did not. And I showed that two different people wrote the documents. And through gritted teeth, the judge agreed with me, but said, it's okay. Uh, the fact that he wrote them at all, aren't, he's still on death row. Um, so here was QB, Antoine QB. He's still in prison. He's on life. In those days in Chicago, things were very brutal. Some guys had come back from the Vietnam War, learning how, having learned how to torture people and uh, applied their trade on especially African-American uh, defendants. Um, there was a big blow up about it because uh, emergency room technicians saw patterns 
Uh, there were court cases and everything, but nobody ever was uh, punished for their torture. But the uh, state of Illinois said, if you were tortured by these folks, you have more um, uh, possibilities of uh, appealing your sentence. This is a long time ago. So here's the confession document. I don't expect you to be able to read it. Uh, but Hubie says he signed what he thought was a tele uh, telephone to his mother. And um, the next time he saw that piece of paper, there was a typed confession. And we'll see it in a second. So did the accused himself author it? Or did he not? Did the patterns in the confession match his? And we have contemporaneous letters that he wrote to his girlfriend, his aunt, and to uh, another uh, person. So that's very lucky. And we have an enormous amount of testifying done by the detective. And guess what? The language doesn't match his at all, but it does match the detective. And uh, I, I'm going to run out of time, so I won't go into any detail, but community of practice was very important here. And complementizer, contraction, discourse, lexical, I, I'll show you a couple. So we looked at complementizer deletion or insertion, actually, and it doesn't match QB. Um, contraction patterns doesn't match QB. Discourse markers doesn't match QB. Let's look at some things that match the police officer. So, like I said, at an unknown time, that certainly was not just, uh, did not come out of an 18-year-old guy's mouth. And then there's then. Now, this is a classic in forensic linguistics. Malcolm Coulthard in England showed that somebody had not authored something because it had this feature of police speak. Now, just because somebody does something in London doesn't mean they do it in Chicago uh, in, during this time, but we have copious examples from the police officer's testimony. QB not only doesn't do the non-canonical, we then went home, he rarely even uses the word then, even when he's doing narratives. Yet the Officer does it all the time. And there's all sorts of other things that I won't get into, but even when QB is trying to be formal, he doesn't use a lot of formal structures. So, for example, in that first example, so I told him if I get out of my bed, I'm going to kick his ass very well. Very well? See, he's trying to be formal. He's writing. So then he shut up as opposed to though. So he then shut up. So I did this seven years ago, and I've been talking to QB every couple of months, and uh, he's been the subject of podcasts, and he now has a very good lawyer firm helping him, but it's very, very hard to undo this kind of thing. And this is the uh, letter I got from the Torture Inquiry and Relief Commission, and the date is August 2016. They said, oh, this is really interesting. We've read your report. Uh, we want to talk to you about it and possibly give QB a shot at getting out 2016. And he still hasn't had the meeting with them. And lastly, my latest criminal case, the prosecuting attorney, this man was accused of um, repeatedly raping his daughter writing in various guises to convince her that this was an appropriate thing. He wrote making believe he was an imam, a priest, a psychologist, and a therapist. 
And that showed consciousness of guilt. If I could show that he wrote it, and it was pretty clear, really, that he had written all these things, and that with the testimony of the girl. Uh, and in this state, Arkansas, it's the jury that sentences people. So he got three consecutive life sentences. Here's well, that was great. <laughs> Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Leonard, for this uh, fantastic, insightful, and informative uh, plenary. And I will stop the recording here.